you, Paul. It's certain as chairman of the board of the Institute, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome everyone here today. Uh, we couldn't have asked for a better day in terms of weather or in terms of the turnout that we've had, and I'm sure we're all enjoying it. It uh, represents a lot of work on the part of the staff at the Institute, and I would like to name at least Bill and Carrie and Mark and Linda and Anita, all of whom have done a lot of work along with many, many volunteers. Peterson, first of all, I'm sure that you know Jenny Peterson. Would you like to just step up and say hello? Oh. Hello, it's wonderful to be here on this beautiful day. Roger and I are enjoying every minute of this, and uh, I hope you will enjoy what Roger has to say. And if you have any questions afterwards, he would love to take them. And I would also, if you have any questions about butterflies or whatever. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Jenny is very much a part of this team. And on the books that have been written, she's done a lot of the work on the, the geography of the birds and so forth. Uh, it now is my great privilege to introduce Roger, who really needs no introduction. And uh, he's here with us today. I, I would just like to show again, I think many of you have seen it, very appropriate. In the Tempo magazine, Roger comes home, and that's what he is. He's coming home here as a young man. He roamed this very area, as many of you have heard on his talk this morning. I remember once over in the 100-acre lot across the street, he pointed out the tree in which he took his first picture, and he almost lost his camera. <coughs> but <coughs> Roger, uh, fortunately, is able to come back in spite of his years, and he's very active, as we all can see. And now it's a great privilege for me to introduce Roger Torrey Peterson. Thank you, John, Dr. Benke, and friends. It's uh, good to be here again. But I also have a feeling of sadness uh, because so many of my old friends from uh, high school days are no longer here. Clarence Beale, who is my most frequent companion after I discovered birds. Lorimer Moe, who conceived the Institute. And then there were the pretty young ladies who remain pretty all their lives. Reba Purcell Reading, Laura Morris Carlson, and others. Are there any others? That's very sad. I, I'm, I'm trying for a hundred, but it's uh, getting kind of lonesome now. I try to get back to Jamestown every year, at least once or twice. I was told that Lucille Ball, who also went to Jamestown High when I was there, uh, um, seldom came back. Uh, she was a sophomore when I was a senior. I, I was the, uh, at that time, was the school nonconformist. I was definitely not the best of students in Jamestown High, even though I graduated at 16. And the reason for that was because I skipped a grade or two after kindergarten. But skipping a grade uh, didn't help. It doesn't help, I don't think. Being younger than um, the other boys, they didn't want me in their games. I was a nuisance. And because the girls preferred my more macho schoolmates who were good at baseball, I was ignored. Too skinny, too many freckles. So I took to the woods with one or two like-minded friends, Clarence Beale and Walter Olson. Birds are the most beautiful, the most dynamic, most observable of all wild things. Um, and they've been the focus of my life ever since I was a boy of 11. But you may wonder, uh, what happened when I was 11 that changed me from a difficult youngster to an obsessed bird watcher? And it was because of my teacher in the seventh grade. And I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again. I recall a comment by Clarence Allen, the headmaster of Rivers School in Brookline, Massachusetts, where I taught many years ago. 
it was about the dilemma of being a teacher. How do teachers know whether their efforts are successful? How do they know whether they have really gotten through? And it may take years to assess this. A teacher may never know. But if I might use my own history as an example, I would not be speaking here, nor would there be Roger Torrey Peterson Institute were it not for Blanche Hornbeck, my teacher in the seventh grade here in Jamestown. Now, um, please bear with me. I'll tell the story again. Miss Hornbeck formed a junior Audubon club, and she gave each of us ten leaflets about birds, each with an outline drawing to color. But coloring in the outlines was not much of an artistic challenge. You can't learn to draw that way. So Miss Hornbeck gave each of us a little box of watercolors and had us copy some color plates by Fuertes. She gave me the blue jay to copy. I thought I did very well, but when our drawings were put on the blackboard up in front, she credited my blue jay to Edith Soul, who sat across the aisle. And I objected, I was very unhappy, but she soon put things straight. Edith Soul isn't here, is he? <laughs> I've often wondered whatever happened, whatever became of Edith Soul. Although the Blue Jay was my first attempt at bird drawing, the incident that hooked me on birds for life took place the following weekend. Um, the moment of awakening came in mid-morning on a Saturday in early April 1920. Free of school, Carl Hammerstrom, a lad who lived up the street, and I crossed the railroad tracks. We climbed Swede Hill to explore new territory. And as, as we approached a woodlot near the old reservoir, uh, I spotted a bundle of brown feathers on the trunk of a tree. It was a flicker, sleeping, probably tired from migration. But I thought it was dead. Gingerly, I touched it on the back, and instantly this inert thing sprang to life, looked at me with wild eyes, then fled on a flash of golden wings. It was like resurrection. What had seemed dead was very much alive. And ever since, birds have seemed to me to be the most vivid expression of life. Um, they have dominated my thoughts, my dreams, my reading, inevitably pulling me into the wider vistas of the environment, including the butterflies, the plants, and the rest of the natural world. We might wonder about the meaning of life. And in fact, uh, uh, Life Books uh, wrote me the other day, wanted a couple hundred words about my thoughts about the meaning of life. And um, what uh, we might wonder about the meaning, all of us, what ignited the life force in the, in the first place, in the beginning. Certainly not a man like being up there in the, in the stratosphere. However, our kind, the human animal, Homo sapiens, the dominant primate, holds the whip hand, uh, and uh, everything else is pretty much at our mercy. Need we be so egocentric as to think only of ourselves and dismiss the countless other forms of life? At the age of 83, having nearly drowned last summer, and having be I've become even more sensitive to the nuances of life and of all living things. I feel very, very happy that I'm alive. Came close not to meeting my 82nd birthday. I think I'll t read that story before I close. You've heard it, I think. The observation of birds can be many things. It can take many forms. It can be an art, a science, an environmental ethic, a recreation, or a sport, depending on the person. Um, Father Pincelli, who is the best birder in the Rio Grande Valley in Texas, insists it can also be a religious experience. And I can see that. And as another devout friend puts it, God's first gospel, long before the Bible was written, was the book of nature, life. And to fantasize a bit, we might call birds his heavenly messengers, not unlike the angels which are always pictured with feathers in their wings. Butterflies fly too, but and uh, they're elegant, vibrant, but they don't sing, except possibly it's so high that we can't hear it. The flowers, uh, lovely though they may be, are rooted to the earth. To me, as a youngster, chafing under the regimentation of the classroom and the demands of a stern father, birds seem to have it all. They're attractive, they sound off with spirit, 
They can fly wherever they choose, whenever they choose. At least so it seems. Ever since that day in April, over 70 years ago, birds have dominated my life. Too narrow a focus? Not really. Watching birds has sharpened my senses, made my hearing far more acute than most, my eyes more perceptive, my reactions quicker, and this awareness has radiated, uh, radiated far beyond the birds, embracing nearly everything that is alive for my fellow. They are indicators, quickly reflecting changes in the environment that we all share. They are sort, uh, sort of an early warning system, sending out signals when things are out of kilter. It's inevitable that the perceptive person who watches birds or mammals or fish or butterflies becomes an environmentalist. Today, if a person does not have at least some interest in the natural world, he feels out of step. Now, if the birds were removed, the balance of nature as we know it would be drastically upset. I, for one, would find the world quite desolate if there were no birds. I recall a remark by Charles Lindbergh in his later years uh, who became uh, concerned about some of the things he saw happening in the world. He told me that if he had to make a choice between having birds on this earth or aircraft, he would choose birds. That was Lindbergh. To quote Henry Beston, we need another wiser and perhaps more mystical concept of birds and other wild things. We patronize them for their incompleteness, but they shall not be measured by man. In a world older and more com complete, uh, complete than ours, they are finished and complete. They're gifted with extensions of the senses we've lost or never had. They live by voices we shall never hear." Unquote. Many people go through life as though they were um, wearing blinders. Their eyes are open, yet they may see nothing of their wild associates. Their ears attuned to motor cars and traffic seldom hip gets the music of nature. The singing of birds, frogs, crickets, or the wind. We have biologists, of course, and biochemists, but we really need more bioengineers, bio lawyers, and biopoliticians. There's been a tremendous renaissance in nature study in recent years. It's been called a form of escapism, but where I looked for boys when I, uh, birds when I was a boy, where I botanist, all around here. The institute will be field oriented. So much of biology these days is laboratory oriented in the Germanic tradition, relying on the microscope and the scalpel. Many students know all about the muscles in a bird's wing or a frog's leg, but know very little about the living animal or even its name. The Institute aims to change that. But the teachers are more or less the bottleneck, and uh, this is where the Institute comes in, and especially the teachers of the teachers. It's not just directly reaching the kids because they're easily reached if, uh, if their uh, teachers can do it. The humane person, the civilized person, readily accepts not only the humane ethic, as we think of it, but also uh, the conservationist philosophy as well as the environmentalist point of view. They're all overlapping and interlocking. It's a reverence for life. I like to think of my own contribution to this interlocking humane conservation environmental movement as one of an um, interpreter and opinion maker through my writing, my painting, and it started with my field guides, which is a visual system putting names to things, employing shapes, patterns, field marks. My field guides are a useful invention, very functional, but to do their job, the drawings are rather formal and schematic. A different art form, if you will. To have done them otherwise would have um, compromised the purpose for which they were intended. Simplification, a shortcut to field recognition so that a person might have some competence and then get on to behavior, ecology, artistic portrayal, environmental exorcism, or whatever. As for my painting, aside from my guides, I intend to get back into oils and canvas again, as well as acrylics, to play with mood and color and light, to paint more sensuously, the kind of painting for which I was originally trained under such masters as Kaiman Nicolaides, John Sloan, and Vincent Dumond, at the Art Students League, the National Academy of Design. But wildlife painting cannot be too far from the discipline of realism without risking affectation. Um, I intend to indulge myself and do a juicier, more painterly kind of painting again, living birds with three-dimensional activity, movement in space, 
and of course some uh, a biological comment. Now at the present time, um, we're updating the European field guide, and Jenny will not have to work on those maps, but she will have to uh, work on the maps again when we do the new eastern one, bringing that up to date. Now the thing is, the birds have wings, they fly, and uh, so do bird watchers nowadays. And so uh, ranges are being extended, and there's always new, the new tricks that uh, the birders are finding out. And as Bob Sindel could tell you, there's all kinds of new tricks that are new since my day. So um, what Jenny and I are involved is just trying to get these guides. Uh, Jenny is the one who has done all the maps, or the most to work on the maps. And uh, she was an environmentalist to begin with, because the Coast Guard working on oil spills. Because uh, a ship that dumps oil, there's almost a fingerprint on it as to who dumped that oil. And so uh, people behave now because of the work they did at the Coast Guard. So um, we're going to, uh, once I get through with that, we're going to, or I'm going to get back to proper painting again. The sort of thing I did for Mill Pond Press and the others. Many of you know my uh, field guide drawings and those are all going to be, the originals are all going to be here at, uh, at the gallery at the Institute in due time. And uh, at least prints of my Audubon-esque paintings, some originals. And uh, then I'm going to do some real proper painting, the kind that uh, I've wanted to do for a long time. So um, and before I close, uh, I probably, um, well, there's several other books, including a biography. Now, there was an autobiography written of me by the Devlins, John Devlin and Grace Naismith. He was New York Times. She was Reader's Digest. And uh, I can say that now they're both gone. He was letter perfect, absolutely perfect. I could tell which chapters he wrote. I could tell chapters which she wrote because uh, she should have been a novelist. <laughs> uh, she'd say, uh, Roger would probably thought this when he did that. Further things from my thoughts. Well, the trouble with being a, a biographer, writing it yourself, you choose to ignore certain people, so that's not quite right either. The things you'd rather forget. And, uh, well, at any rate, I'll do it. So that's uh, all I had. But some of you may not have heard about my drowning and and uh, if you'll bear with me I'll read the account of it see I was off the coast of Maine this just happened last year and I if I drowned I wouldn't be here today my voice wouldn't be quite as strong either because it was getting kind of flat um, but be, uh, because our eyes were on the cormorants lined up on shore only one of us was aware of the rogue wave now how many here know what a rogue wave is it's a very little uh, understood phenomenon. And uh, one of the news reports said that, that a rogue whale had done it. <laughs> no, no, even the New York Times wasn't correct because the nurse wouldn't allow any news people to talk to me. So they got it second hand. But our boat was rolled over a couple hundred yards off Western Egg Rock off the coast of Maine in 15 or 16 feet of water. I was wrapped in eye-dazzling foam one moment in uh, everything gulping seawater down and then the next moment all this dark green water around me and dark objects sinking all around me. thousands of tens of thousands of dollars worth of camera equipment my friends and all their belongings uh, but there was no time to panic another gulf or two of seawater could send me choking to the bottom where I could just drift away to nothing and if I'd had one bad review of the western guide I probably would have taken another gulp <laughs> Struggling to the surface, I had just time to think to take in some air and hold it as I went under again with the next comber. I repeated this several times, and had it not been for the courage and strength of young Bob Bowman, who helped me keep my head above water, I would not have had my 82nd birthday. That was just, just a year ago, this month. And in fact, he grabbed my head up. Did I see the light? And I said, the surface, I had just time to take in some air as I went under again with the next comber. Uh, over you now our 23 foot vessel was floating upside down and I once there I clung to its round bottom with my five foot over again my eyeglasses in between waves I could touch bottom only I was too weak to soar by the others and laid on some dry rocks warm by the afternoon sun it was a, uh, about 4.30 I 4.30 p.m. Michael Mayle actually uh, had to lie down on top of me for body warmth and there I lay sorely bruised with arms scraped raw and bleeding by barnacles and I thought my left hip was broken or my ribs it felt as though they were 
retching to get rid of the salt water and shivering, just shuddering. I was grateful for the wet garments that were put over me. Hypothermia was setting in. And again, had it not been for Michael Mayo, who added his own warmth and positive encouragement, I might not have pulled through. Earlier, his wife, Judy, who was a good swimmer, had saved Michael Mayo himself when he was being pulled under by his heavy television equipment, which weighed 50 or 60 pounds. It became hooked on his battery belt. She dove down and unhooked him otherwise. And uh, if she hadn't been a good swimmer, and the reason she was a good swimmer, the only good swimmer, was because her mother's first husband drowned many years ago in Colorado. And so she got the swimming lessons and she spent all her time in the swimming pool. So now with all of these chance things, uh, all of us live by chance in a way. But with the, she, uh, with the salt water still dripping from her uh, sand, leave Jamestown or come back to Jamestown. Thank you. Are there any questions that you'd like at this moment? Do you have any time for questions? Address here this afternoon. It really isn't afternoon yet, is it? But it will be soon. Your, your presence here today will make this a very memorable day for all of us in our visit back to nature and the birds. And uh, we in Jamestown certainly can be thankful that you had enough hair to be pulled out of the, uh, the I ocean. Think, I think it was those books I had. Okay. I had okay. okay. I always keep the promise. Well, that's great. We, we are very fortunate here in Jamestown to have to be able to count you a person of great international stature to be counted among us here. And we hope you and Ginny come back often. Thank you. Now, do we have time for questions? Yes? What kind of a bird is a petrel? Is it a, a petrel is a little uh, seabird, which um, looks like a, almost looks like a swallow. It's over the ocean waves, and then it, um, they used to be called uh, just Wilson's petrel. Now they call them Wilson's storm petrels. They're always playing with names. Well, I feel that Mother Carrie's chicken is, uh, is the sailor's name. I sailed on a sailboat on the uh, Atlantic two years ago, and it was called Stormy Petrel. Stormy Petrel. Well, the Stormy Petrel is the British one. Yes. Peterson? Peterson, are there as many bird species in this area today as when you were here as a child? I would, I would say yes. Uh, some species have gone down in numbers, which worries us. And it might, could, might be lake weather, or what is it called here? Lake effect. Lake effect. And this is from the industrial cities. We'll, bl we'll blame the other cities because Jamestown is not quite as industrial anymore. But we're getting the effects of all that. <laughs>